So as Gil has rightly stated, the topic of my speech is the pursuit of meaning, a brief lesson, and apologetics. And I chose this topic because I'm thinking about making this my discipline, and so I just pray that you would listen with an open mind. Mm -hmm. I'd like to open my talk tonight about an illustration. It's going to come from the Bible, and it's a story about King Solomon. Uh, if any, most of us are familiar with the story of Solomon. Uh, he was very wealthy. Uh, he had a lot of wives, unfortunately, polygamy is not a good thing. And he also, had, he also had a lot of wisdom. But one of the interesting things uh, that happened with Solomon was that he talked about, if you read in his uh, Ecclesiastes, he talks about um, how his whole life he went through the steps of acquiring wealth, how much he labored, how much he planted vineyards and all this stuff. But an interesting thing is he said in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 2, he says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from me. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on the works that my hands had done, and the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed, all was vanity. And grasping for the wind, there was no profit under the sun. And it reminds me of the quote by G.K. Chesterton, who is an English Christian philosopher. He said, Meaningless, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaning this comes from being weary of pleasure. When you have exhausted that last dream and you find it leaves you barren or empty. Uh, it's funny because Deion Sanders uh, talked about his testimony of how he came to know God. Uh, it was the night they won the Super Bowl, uh, but I'm not sure what team they beat. Uh, and he went back to his hotel room and he told the interviewer that it was like an empty climax. Like after he got back to his room, he said he felt so empty inside. And that night, to kind of top it off, he ordered a Lamborghini thinking that that would kind of seal the deal. <laughs> so that night, he accepted Jesus Christ into his life. And I can only imagine the empty feelings that King Solomon, Deion Sanders, and many others like them, who have spent a lifetime of indulging in desires and passions that ultimately don't bring any value to life. To pursue meaning is to pursue purpose. Once we have identified the purpose of life and have identified our purpose for living, only then can we begin our pursuit of meaning. And there are four steps one can take to really uh, find meaning in life. The first one is that we have to have a sense of wonder. Now, as young kids, we were always mesmerized by fairy tales. You know, if you, do, if you don't do this, you will turn into this. If you're not back by this time, this is going to happen. And as we get older, we see that our sense of wonder kind of, it's, it's harder to, to, to please. And so, for me, as a Christian, uh, I get my sense of wonder in the very person of Jesus Christ. Now, let me make a distinction. I'm not saying that fairy the, the thing with fairy tales is that they're fantastic. The thing about the Bible that is, is fantastically true. A Scottish preacher uh, gave a statement in the 20th century about the very personality, uh, or I should say mystery, of the Jesus' personality. It reads, he was the meekest and loyalest of all the sons of men, yet he spoke of coming on the clouds of heaven with the glory of God. He was so austere that evil spirits and demons cried out in terror at his coming, yet he was so genuine, winsome, and approachable that the children loved to play with him and the little ones would nestle in his arms. His presence at the innocent gaiety of a village wedding was like the presence of sunshine. No one was ever half so compassionate to sinners, yet spoke such red-hot scorching words about sin. A bruised weed, reed he would not break. His whole life was love. Yet on one occasion he demanded of the Pharisees how they ever expected to escape the damnation, of, the damnation of hell. He was a dreamer of dreams and a seer of visions, yet for sheer, for sheer stark realism, he has all of our self-styled realists soundly beaten. He was a servant of all, washing the disciples' feet, yet massively strolled into the temple, and the hucksters and money chamber, cha changers fell over the one another from the mad rush and the fire they saw blazing in his eyes. He saved others, yet at last he did not save himself. There is nothing in history like the union of contrast that confronts us in the gospel. The mystery of Jesus is the mystery of divine personality. And so the first, one, the first step was having a sense of wonder. The second is we have to have a sense of truth. We live in a world today that has contradicting worldviews. It's easy to say what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. Uh, in other, other terms saying all truth is relative. However, taking this approach can be very deadly. There's a vast difference between truth and error. Secretarianism has told us that the difference is quite unimportant and it really doesn't matter what one believes. 
However, whenever an affirmative statement is made about the truth, the opposite is excluded. So when one says truth is relative, what they're really saying is that someone has the option of denying that statement, thus making that statement false. So logically, truth can't be relative. We live in an age of moral relativism, uh, and we live in an age of moral relativism where truth seems quite elusive, where the very idea of whether moral principles, whether moral principles really do exist is challenged. However, when taking a step back, we can actually see how we come to this postmodern style of thinking. It started back when movies first hit the scenes, people acting married when they really weren't, people acting dead when they really weren't, and surgeons acting as they feel really surgeons. Is it any wonder that truth today it's blurred when we are constantly filled with fictional uh, entertainment. And Jesus gives a powerful testimony, uh, a statement when he's standing before the Roman uh, judge, uh, Pilate. During his interview, Pilate asked the question, uh, the reason, asked the question of why he came to earth. And Jesus said the very purpose for him to coming into the earth was to bear witness into the truth. And he finishes this statement and said that everybody on this side of truth hears my voice. So first we have a sense of wonder. First, we have, second, we have a sense of truth. Third, we have to have a sense of love. We find that love only exists in relationships. We are beings, to be, we are beings created to be in relationships with one another. And the more we understand this the central truth, the more meaningful our lives will be. Scientists are beginning to realize that the very makeup of our beings is, is, is engineered for us to love. Yale did a study of 119 men and 40 women who were undergoing coronary surgery. The study revealed that those who felt the most love had substantially less coronary artery blockage. The study revealed that those who felt the most love, I'm sorry, this, the re researchers found that the emotional factors were significant predictors of the severity of artery blockage. And this remained true even when controlling for age, diet, exercise, cholesterol, diabetes, and other risk factors. And fourthly, we have to have a sense of security. So we have a sense of wonder, we have a sense of truth, we have a sense of love. Last, we have a sense of security. How does one find security in today's world? It goes beyond the fear of violence, but begins with the human touch and is a need that is inherent. I remember reading a story about a therapist who was into, went into a, uh, one of a slum part of a neighborhood, and what they would do is they would go and pick up homeless women or women that were kind of really not in the, the best of situation. And she said at one time as she was working on the one lady, uh, the, the lady started to cry. And so fearing that she had heard it, she stopped and asked her, was she applying too much pressure? And with the tears running down the woman's face, she said, no, but this is the first time that somebody has ever touched my feet. Mm. I'd like to end with this story. Uh, there was a, and this is a true story as well. There was a young man named Darren who seemed to be habitual. He had been in many halfway houses that had given up on him and expelled him. In one place, the staff had gone on strike until Darren was sent somewhere else. He was a master car thief and ran with a group of other teams that could almost literally break into any car they desired. It was finally decided that he would have to go to be sent to a juvenile facility because no other halfway house would take him in. Finally, one experienced youth worker decided to take on the challenge of helping this young man change for the good. The first week in the new home, Darren shattered all the windows by somehow acquiring a BB gun. After only a few weeks, the youth worker was on the bring, was on the bridge of giving up. They repeatedly told Darren that they wanted to work out, but he would have to abide to the rules. Darren, in all his power, tried desperately, but a few incidents pushed the whole family over the edge. There was one morning when Darren was up, and the family woke up, and Darren was getting ready to fight one of the residents, and he was threatening them with a weed cutter. So after that, the following Sunday, uh, the youth worker decides to invite Darren over for dinner. And so when he, when he goes to pick Darren up from uh, where he is, uh, the youth worker has his little son with him. And so as the son sees Darren, he jumps out of the car, he runs over to him and wraps his arms around his leg. And he starts nestling in his pocket. And Darren was a car thief. And the night before, Darren had stolen five cars, and he parked them in the church parking lot. And so the kid goes into the pocket, pulls out the key, and starts playing with them. So at dinner, Darren sees the kid playing with the keys. And so upon leaving, Darren asks the kid if he would like to keep the keys. Little did the youth worker know that a life was being transformed right in front of him. So instead of that night of Darren going out to rob and to steal cars, Darren went to church and gave his life over to Christ. A hug from an innocent child melted a hardened heart. In a world looking for security, 
If the church is going to be the church of Jesus Christ, it must learn the power of love before 